The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 7 through 18 there. Luke chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear this threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, Lord Jesus, we pray that we hear what you would have us to hear that we may do what you call us to do. Lord, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have to tell you, whenever I read about John the Baptist, I can't help but ask myself, why? I mean, why? Why are people coming to hear John? What is it about John that brought folks out to hear him in the first place? I mean, I want you to think about it. Would you call him to be pastor? Would any church that just wasn't desperate call John to preach to them? I mean, think about it. First of all, I mean, John is not as well dressed as some of us. I mean, doesn't even own a bow tie. Stands out in the middle of a creek in a camel's hair diaper with a leather belt around his waist. That stuff went out of fashion a long time ago. He's got shaggy hair. I at least trim my beard every once in a while, and John doesn't seem to. He even has bits of breakfast stuck in it. And I've always thought that's weird because he's John the Baptist. John the one standing out in the middle of a river full of water. You think every once in a while, just a little, to wash it out of the beard. But no. Then then there's his message and his presentation style. Now, some folks like it when a preacher gets red-faced and hoops and hollers, so long as he's hooping and hollering at everybody else. But here's John. He's not exactly encouraging to folks. He doesn't have what you might call a sunny disposition. I don't think when the, when the sermon was over, John stood on the shore and folks came by and said, good sermon preacher. I think they avoided eye contact and strolled on home. He doesn't tell jokes, doesn't rattle off memory verses, hasn't have any compelling stories, and he shouts. In fact, I love the way Clarence Jordan translates it. He, he sees the people gathered on the shore and says, you sons of snakes. I love it. He just shouts at people. Calls them snakes. Come on, how are people coming out there to hear him? Why? 
Why are there crowds of people hanging around a river outside in the ancient Near East where it's a hundred on a good day, gathered around a river to listen to this man who looks crazy, baptizing him? Why do they come to be baptized by him? When if he were a preacher today, somebody say, I think you ought to tone it down, don't you? I think he ought to hush it up. He ought to move on. He ought to say something to encourage us a little more. I have to tell you, I just don't get it. Why? Why are they coming out to hear John? Were people just curious about what was going on out in the wilderness? I know that's the case for a lot of my friends in ministry, particularly my, my friends who are women who feel called to ministry. Church calls them to be a pastor. And, and, and if they had called a man or anybody else, it's, it's yesterday's news. It's back on the back page, somewhere down in the newspaper. But they call a woman, it's on the front page, above the fold. Folks come out, a woman preacher? What's that look like? And they come and they fill the pews just to see. Is that what it was with John? I heard about this fellow John. He's crazy, wild, he doesn't even own a brush. Doesn't brush his teeth, stands out in the middle of the water. Doesn't even come up and stand with everybody else. Just stands out there, shouts at folks. You want to go see him? There's this guy named John by the river. Got folks stirred up, say something else. Let's go check him out. I'm sure, I'm sure there were folks who just had to see the sight of John for themselves. Hearsay wasn't enough. They wanted to experience it firsthand. So maybe, maybe some of these folks come out to see John just to see it. They've heard folks in town, and now they want to see it. But then again, there isn't a whole lot going on in those days to keep somebody's attention. No daytime soap operas, no podcasts to listen to, no 24-hour news channels, none of that sort of stuff. Maybe. Maybe they were sitting around bored. You can imagine the conversation, can't you? Hey, Earl, what are you up to this afternoon? Oh, I don't know. Figured I'd just watch the sand dry. What about you? Oh, I don't know. Figured I'd try to hold my breath again, see how long it takes. Hey, I heard about this fella down at the Jordan. Real crazy fella preaching down there. We like preaching. Let's go listen to him. You want to go check him out? Sure, sure. Why not? Ain't got nothing better to do. Maybe, maybe folks were just bored. And they went down to the Jordan. After all, there was a day when there wasn't much going on. Sort of like now or a generation or two ago. Wasn't much going on on a Sunday. So what do we do? Well, we've got to have another church service. Folks are just sitting around at the house staring at the wall before work tomorrow. Let's have another church service. There were no games on TV, no practices to go to. Maybe it was the same way. Folks just sitting around, needed something to pass the time. Let's go down to the Jordan, see what's shaking down there. I don't know. But curiosity and boredom won't keep the attention of many people. Curiosity can be quenched by the sight of whatever it is that piques it. Oh yeah, well there he is, we've seen him now, we can tell everybody else, we've seen him, we've seen him. And boredom, boredom is just seeking entertainment or distraction, and John was neither of those things. So what was it? I mean really, what was it that brought people down to the Jordan, out into the wilderness to see John? Maybe they were seeking something. Maybe they were looking for an answer. I wonder sometimes the same thing about why folks get up on a Sunday and come to church. I think for a lot of us, if we're honest, it's rote habit. But for some, maybe for all of us on certain, certain days, we have an itch we just can't quite scratch. We're looking for an answer. Maybe. Maybe that's why they came to see John. Perhaps they came out because they heard maybe there was something there they couldn't find on the display tables at the flea market. Couldn't call in for the commercial on television to order. Maybe there was something they were missing. There were folks looking for more than just another fad, just another get right with the Lord quick scheme, something like that. Is it possible that the folks who came out to be baptized by John had questions that couldn't be answered by the same old institutions that had been offering them answers for so long? 
Could it be that we could be the same way? That we could come to places in our lives where the same old answers given by the same old institutions just aren't enough? The questions seem bigger than any answer were ever given. Maybe that's why they came to see John. Because they had questions. And maybe they hoped John had some answers. But whatever questions, whatever inquiries brought this crowd out into the wilderness, like Randy said this morning, John doesn't exactly greet them with good words of tidings. You brood of vipers! Who warned you about the wrath that's to come? Well, thanks, John. Appreciate it. You brood of vipers? Who warned you? Who let you in on the secret to come out here? Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. John says, don't come out here with that noise. God can raise up from these rocks children to Abraham. Don't think your pedigree is enough. Who warns you? Even now the axe, he says, is lying at the root of the trees. And the ones that don't bear good fruit are thrown into the fire. I can imagine. John says this to a few folks. I had enough of this. And they turn around and go home. Can't you see it? John says this. Folks lined up on the bank. I don't have to put up with this. I can go get shouted out by the priest at the temple. And they turn around and walk. There's always another preacher somewhere with a, a softer word, a nicer word. Always someone on television, some book you can read, some preacher somewhere else. has got something else to say that might agree better with their stomachs. But not John. But those who stayed, those who listened to John's words, heard him call these folks out and call him themselves out. John called them out of their previously comfortable way of thinking about religion as this inherited system of rules and laws, of do's and don'ts, a family heritage. See, John calls them out of their way of thinking that, that everyone and everything was fine so long as they could get out the family Bible and trace that family tree all the way back to Abraham. Everything was fine. John says, no, not anymore. John calls them out and says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Especially after so many of them likely came to John believing that this baptism was a quick fix. John, a lot of scholars believe, probably came out of the Essenes in the Dead Sea where they baptized for cleanliness, ritual purity. And so maybe they came out and saying, well, we can try that. Catholicism didn't work. Let's be a Baptist. Let's see how that goes. And so they come out hoping for a quick fix in the waters of the Jordan. But it's only after this fiery welcome from John, only after he calls him out, that the folks in the crowds start to reveal why they're really there. Why they're there in the first place. Because they have questions. John says all this in his introduction of sorts, and they say, what then should we do? It's a fitting question to ask John the baptizer. To ask any preacher who just stands up in the pulpit, slams his fist down and says, get right with the Lord. It's right to ask, what should we do? That's what the crowd asked John. It's the question one asks when you're most helpless. When you have tried everything and it seems there's nothing left to do, any stranger walking by, sitting there on the curb, you'll look up at them and say, what am I supposed to do? What should we do? It's a question we all ask. And we just don't know what to do. And we hate not knowing what to do, don't we? We want to know what to do. We want to have the answer. And of course, you and I live in an era where mystery's been robbed from us. And we often have the answer, don't we? What do you do when somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer to? When your kid or your grandkid says, what's a dodo bird look like? Do you sit down and draw them a picture? What do you do? Reach in your pocket. Dodo bird. That's what it looks like. The mystery's been robbed from us. You want to know how to do something? It's in your pocket. 
Want to know how to change the ABS sensors on a 96 GMC Sierra? I'm telling you this because I've done it. You just Google it. There's a YouTube video, step-by-step -step instructions. It's right there. We've been robbed of the mystery. So we, when we say, what should we do? We have a source. It seems we've all but eradicated the need to ask the question, what should I do? But yet we still ask it, don't we? Still those instances in life, those deep spiritual corners of existence, when we're sitting in the ICU waiting room and Google doesn't have an answer. When we're standing by the casket as family and friends file by, we can't, we can't punch that in the computer. What do we do? What do we do? And it doesn't seem to be a video, a list of instructions on a PDF file. What do we do? When we face those times in our lives, those times when we, like the people who were coming down to the Jordan River, ask, what should we do? I think we secretly hope that we already know the answer. Because we hope for a religious answer, don't we? Or at least we force one sometimes, I think. When the world seems dark, when life seems to be hitting a rough spot, when you can't sleep at night, when the stress seems too much to overcome, you just, you just want an answer to be a so-called better Christian, don't you? You want to ask, what should we do? And you want somebody to say, uh, just pray more. But I pray every morning when I get up. Oh, well, pray every night before you go to bed. What should we do? How, many, how often do you read your Bible? I read a psalm in the morning and a chapter from one of Paul's epistles every, every, every day at breakfast. Oh, well, you should probably stop in the middle of the day and read it. That'll help. That'll help. What should I do? How often do you go to church? Oh, about one Sunday a month, maybe two. You should go every time the doors are open. That's the kind of answer we want. Tell me what to do so I can do it. I think we hope for answers like that because they at least make some kind of sense to us. We can mark them down, count them, quantify them. It makes sense to us that if we want to get good with God, that we've got to do more of those things that sound churchy, more of those things that sound religious, and less of those things that don't. But what about when all of that doesn't work? What about when we do all those sorts of things and it doesn't help? What about we do all of those things already and they still don't seem to be enough? Because truthfully, friends, they aren't enough. What do we do? When we ask, what should I do, and those usual answers aren't enough, it seems most folks still sort of fall back into the desire for a quick fix answer. Too often people approach faith the same way they approach saving money or losing weight. Can I do it for six weeks? Six months. I want a step-by-step -step guide. When we ask, what should we do? We expect answers like, well, if you can do this one thing for 10 minutes every day, with these 10 steps, preachers even write sermon series this way. 10 things to a happier life. If you can change this one thing, it's a clickbait thing, right? This one thing will make your life instantly better. We want that because they sound catchy because they're clearly outlined and presented to us. But I think one of the reasons we like those answers, if we're honest, is because when they don't work, we can always blame the method. It's like I heard a man say one time in a talk not too long, long ago. Someone asked him, why aren't you a pastor? He said, well, because I know why churches hire pastors. He said, churches hire pastors to do things the way they've always done them, so that when it doesn't work, they can blame the preacher. It's the same thing. We want these answers, we want these things that we know already work, and then when they don't, well, it must be that and not whatever's lurking behind it. We like these systematized, neat, organized answers to life's hard questions. But then again, then again, sometimes I think, I think the best we can hope for is that there's no answer at all. Think about it. How many times have you told yourself or someone else or had someone tell you, what should I do? Just be patient and it'll blow over. 
Don't do anything. It'll take care of itself. Just be patient. It'll blow over. I think if it weren't so strange, I'd probably have that etched on my tombstone. This too shall pass. Somebody may take that the wrong way, though. I know some of you said or thought I have. There's nothing really we can do because it's all part of God's plan. So we say, what should we do? And I think sometimes we secretly hope the answer is nothing. Don't do anything. Leave it alone. Let sleeping dogs lie. Because you could wind up making it worse. What should we do? We hope the answer is nothing. Maybe they hope John said, What should we do, John? Nothing? Just get baptized. What should we do? We ask when faced with the great mysteries of faith. And so often we want answers that fit our preconceptions. Answers that fit into nice, neat religious categories. Answers that are easy to follow. Or answers that are no answers at all. Nothing. Do nothing. But the truth is, however, that the answer to that very question is so often, I'd say all the time, not an easy one. And that means it's an answer we seldom, if ever, want to hear. Three times we hear that question in the text this morning. Three times there's a question, the same question from the crowd to John. The crowds ask him, what then should we do? And John says, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Hang on, what? No, 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 John. What should we do if we're supposed to repent? What are we supposed to do if we're supposed to be better Christians, more godlike? What are we supposed to do, John? That's the question we're asking. John says, if you've got two coats and somebody has none, give them the one you have. And the same with people who don't have food. That's not even Sunday school stuff. That's entry-level preschool thinking. Share. So then the tax collectors pipe up. They're there to be baptized. you ever notice that? These aren't just the rabble. This isn't just the people who are on the margins. The tax collectors are there. They came to be baptized, and so they asked John, Teacher, what about us? What should we do? I don't know, maybe they expected a more, a more holy answer. Be baptized, go to the temple. No. What does John say? Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. No, no, John, you misunderstand. No, no, you misunderstand. John tells these tax collectors to simply do their job the right way. Tax collectors in the ancient world made their, their living by charging more tax than was required. Sometimes as much as five times what tax was due. And they kept the difference for themselves. John just tell them to do their job and do it right. Treat people fairly. So then the soldiers. Soldiers are there to be baptized. The Roman soldiers who were the image of power, the image of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Here they are by the Jordan. And they ask him, what about us? What should we do? John's got an answer for them. He doesn't say, quit being Romans. He doesn't say, leave the army. He doesn't say, convert to Judaism and be baptized. What does he say? Do not extort money from anyone by threats of accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Now that doesn't sound like a sermon. That doesn't sound like a gospel tract. Do your job and do it right, John says. These soldiers had used their positions of power, their intimidating place in society, to just threaten people, to blackmail them, to go into homes and occupy them whenever they wanted. And John calls them out on their abuses of power and calls them to a life in stark contrast of what they've been used to, a life of just doing your job and doing it the right way. You see, when, when these from the crowd ask John, what should we do? John doesn't respond with a churchy answer. He doesn't give them some prescriptive answer for securing their personal comfort, nor does he let them off the hook by saying, nothing, God will take care of it. John, in essence, tells them, you have to reshape your lives in doing the right thing. 
They must reorient their lives to think less of themselves, to want less than to think more of others, and how they may show compassion to others. When John talks about the axe already lying at the root of the tree, we like to think it's a metaphor for those people who aren't saved, those people who aren't like us, those people who haven't been dunked in the water. But what if John, what if John is speaking to the ways that God is purging our lives of those selfish desires that keep us from loving God and each other more? What if that's what's being thrown into the unquenchable fire? What if the winnowing fork in the coming Christ hand isn't a tool meant to cast souls into hell, but an instrument of refinement meant to toss our selfishness, our egos, our personal comfort into the wind, into God's cleansing fire of compassion? What should we do? It's easy to boil it all down to a few steps, isn't it? To say we should pray this prayer, walk this aisle, be baptized in a certain way, go to this many services, read this translation of the Bible, don't do this handful of things, do this handful of things, make, some, make sure you make some kind of stance on some issues, and then when the day arrives, when Jesus shows up, you can tell them you followed all the rules, and you told others that they had better follow the rules too, and Jesus will pat you on the back, say you kept out of trouble, kept your nose clean, and now you'll get a plot of paradise you've been waiting for. But here's the thing. If following Jesus doesn't change something deep within you right now, if it doesn't compel to let you to let go of yourself, to share with others, to seek justice, to change the world, to love God and neighbors more now, then are you really following Jesus? Or are you still trying to find those easy answers to questions like, what should we do? Are you following Jesus in his example? Or are you tugging on his robe because John didn't give you a good enough answer? What are we supposed to do? This Advent, as we look forward to the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, And as we look even farther to His return in the coming future, let us strive to show love to one another. To answer the question, what should we do by the way we live our lives? And may we we find that our answer is one of unconditional Christ-filled love. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we trust that when we have questions, when we ask, what should we do? Lord, that you give us the answer. That you have given us the answer in the cross of Calvary. Lord, you show us the way even now as you are present among us. So come, Holy Spirit, and speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to see the answers you have in store for us, even when they're hard, even when we don't like them, even when they confront us with our own selves. So come, Holy Spirit, move in our presence, speak to our hearts, We pray in Christ's name. Amen.